This is the beginning. The all new Chrysler LeBaron. Back in 1977, Chrysler brought back a model name that it had been using on various models for over 30 years, the LeBaron. Produced over five generations that often confusingly overlapped with one another, the LeBaron name lasted another 18 years, and it was on almost every type of car, from sedans, wagons, coupes, convertibles, and even a performance-oriented model. This is the story of the Chrysler LeBaron. This is my old car. All with Chrysler's new 770 protection plan. New LeBaron from Chrysler. Driving to be the best. Thanks for the many suggestions to review the Chrysler LeBaron. And again, thanks to all of you for the hundreds of other suggestions you have provided. Sometimes I get requests to review cars that I have already done in previous episodes. So in case you haven't seen what else is on my channel, check out my playlist here. Now back to today's episode. Long before the LeBaron most of us remember, this name started as a separate company outside of Chrysler as freelance design consultants and coach builders in the 1920s. Their most famous work was on Chrysler's luxury Imperial models, but also for rivals at Duesenberg, Packard, and Cadillac. Starting in 1955, Chrysler spun off Imperial as a separate luxury brand, with LeBaron being its top-of-the-line model. The Imperial LeBarons competed directly with rivals from Lincoln and Cadillac, and outlived rival Packard by several years. Chrysler kept the Imperial brand for 20 years, ultimately ending it thanks to the mid-70s energy crisis and recession. With the downsizing taking place across all the big three to make their cars more fuel efficient, the LeBaron name was resurrected in 1977 on a much different car than it was under the Imperial brand. And few other cars add more style to it than the new size Chrysler LeBaron. The 1977 LeBaron shared a platform with a Dodge Aspen and Plymouth Volare. Volare. Although their bodies were different than the Chrysler, which was marketed as a more upscale model. As was common then, they still offered V8 engines, although detuned to meet stricter fuel efficiency requirements. In addition to coupes and sedans, a wagon was also available, bringing back the name Town & Country, a name that would come back again later as a minivan. There was even a concept version of the LeBaron with one of Chrysler's turbine engines, with a unique front end and T-tops, but Chrysler's financial condition prevented the entire turbine program from becoming a reality. The look of the late 70s LeBarons were similar to the early to mid 70s land yacht design, although shrunken down to improve gas mileage but by 1980, they were redesigned again to follow the 80s trend of smaller boxy cars with upright roof lines, grills, and no hint of any aerodynamics. Dodge would continue the boxy trend with its very similar Diplomat. The LeBaron also offered a limited edition 5th Avenue trim, although a few years later, that name separated from the LeBaron to become its own model line. However, the biggest changes were yet to come, with the LeBaron moving to the K-Car platform in 1982. Chrysler often had Ricardo Montalban pitching many of their models back then, with the new LeBaron line being no exception. And now new LeBarons come with five years or 50,000 miles of protection on the engine and powertrain, protection against outer body rust through, and free scheduled maintenance. Initially offered in just coupes and sedans, later in 1982, Chrysler introduced a convertible model, which was the first convertible offered by any domestic automaker since Cadillac's Eldorado in 1976. By 1983, they introduced what would eventually become a cult classic, a limited edition town and country convertible, intended to resemble the 1940s town and country, swapping out the latter's real wood doors for fake wood veneer. This is a 1983 Chrysler LeBaron. Or what's left of it? Just a few years later, in 1987, director John Hughes made this car famous in the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Although in the movie, it wasn't badged as a Chrysler LeBaron, but instead, Hughes called it the Grand Detroit Farm Country Turbo Convertible, with a Chrysler Pentastar hood ornament replaced with a Grand Detroit D, and a custom green paint job that looked even more hideous than the fake wood. Some of the parts in the car came from a Dodge 600 convertible to help further distance it from the actual car it once was. Chrysler insisted that their badging be removed from the car, since the movie didn't exactly show the car in its best light. Top of the morning, officer. Hi. Is there something I can help you with? the hell are you driving here? One of the more famous, or possibly infamous, features of this generation LeBaron, and many other Chrysler cars of the time, was the EVA, or Electronic Voice Alert System. Your washer fluid is low. Although it sounded like a child's speak and spell game, e, that is correct. Chrysler clearly thought this was cutting edge technology. Their intentions were clearly very good, 
but they didn't take into consideration that most people really were not comfortable with their cars talking to them. I don't intend to drive around in a car that talks back to me. The K-Car version of the LeBaron lasted up through 1988. However, just to make things confusing for consumers, in 1985, Chrysler introduced the LeBaron GTS, a five-door hatchback that rode on the Chrysler H platform, which was itself derived originally from the K-Car. Dodge had a rebadge of the same car, called the Lancer, a name they once had on cars in the 50s and 60s. Both were intended to be more performance-oriented, although in base trim it still had the same 2.2-liter 4 as the K-Car LeBaron's, although a turbo version was also available. The idea of a sporty LeBaron didn't last long, with the GTS name dropped by 1989. The Lancer ended in 89 as well, although in its last two years it offered the Lancer Shelby, a special appearance and handling package whose four-cylinder turbo made 175 horsepower when mated to a manual transmission. Less than 500 Lancer Shelbys were ever made. The LeBaron coupes and convertibles switched to the J platform for 1987, which, like the H platform, was derived from the K car. The J platform only offered coupes and convertibles since the five-door H platform GTS was still available at that time. The third generation was a radical departure from before, changing the 80s box to a more rounded, sleeker look that foreshadowed the more aerodynamic styling that many cars changed to in the 90s. Completing the stylish look were retractable covers over the headlamps. Back then I still preferred headlights that popped up as opposed to being hidden behind doors, but it was still a cool look nonetheless. Engine options also improved, now sharing the Turbo 4 or V6 that you could also get in the Dodge Daytona. In fact, the interior of the LeBaron was almost identical to the Daytona, despite the Daytona being built on the G-Body platform, which yet again was, of course, a variation of the K-Car. Chrysler seriously got their mileage out of the original K-Car design. By 1992, just like the Daytona's loss of its pop-up headlamps, the LeBaron lost its retractable headlamp doors, replaced with less costly composite headlamps. Some of the LeBarons from this generation were built in Mexico, and as a result, some were also sold there, but were branded as the Chrysler Phantom, which was Chrysler's top-of-the-line model in Mexico. They continued in Mexico as late as 1993, even with higher-performance turbocharged RT models. This generation of LeBaron was also one of the most confusing to consumers, with so many option packages available that came and went between 1987 and the end of the generation in 1995. You had the Highline model, which was an odd name since it was the base trim, but you also had LX, Premium LX, GT, GT Turbo, GTC, GTC Turbo, and simply Premium. Although the coupe and convertible LeBarons lasted up through 1995, just to add more confusion, Chrysler brought back the LeBaron sedan in 1990, this time using the AA body, which yes, was still based on the K-Car. This sedan was simply a rebadged Dodge Spirit, or Plymouth Acclaim, but by having the Chrysler nameplate, it was intended to be the more luxury-themed option, with Plymouth maintaining its role as a value-themed model, and the Dodge leaning more towards a sportier trim, especially with the Dodge Spirit RT. This third-generation LeBaron sedan offered a Landau trim level, which meant that it had the Landau top, basically a soft vinyl covering over the back portion of the roof. Although Landau roofs of the 90s covered far less of the roof than they did back in the 70s, the fact that they hadn't completely gone out of style by the 90s is, at least to me, quite amazing. By 1994, it was the end of the line for the LeBaron sedan, replaced by the Chrysler Cirrus, along with its cloud-themed sibling, the Dodge Stratus, followed soon after by the Plymouth Breeze. Just a year later, the LeBaron name would finally end for good, with the coupes and convertibles replaced by the Chrysler Sebring. The Sebring was similar to the LeBaron in that it used the same name on different cars, although with the Sebring they were much different cars, not just K-Car variants. The Sebring Coupe was based on the Mitsubishi Eclipse, whereas the Sebring Convertible was based on the JA platform that was shared with the Chrysler Cirrus. The look of the two Sebrings was clearly quite different, so having the same name on each just added unnecessary confusion, at least I thought so at the time. With the LeBaron name being used across so many different models, the name likely brings back different memories to different people. Where one may remember it as a boxy 80 sedan, others may remember it as a curvy sporty coupe, but I suspect most remember the classic convertibles of the 80s and 90s that once seemed to be everywhere. They are like no other cars in America, Europe, or Japan. Today most have faded from our roads, but not from the minds of those who once owned them, or those hardened souls who still keep them alive today. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. 
See you next time. Do you have any idea how glad I am I didn't kill you? Do you have any idea how glad I'd be if you had? <laughs>